It's been well over 200 years since she met her fate at the guillotine. Dressed in virginal white, flawless clothing she'd managed to acquire despite spending the previous nine months in a cell. Determined to make a final, lasting sartorial impression. And it's lasted. She's an icon. In the truest sense, her image, like the Greek Orthodox panels of my youth, is ever-present. It's instantly recognizable referent, ripe for visual iteration. Queen of frivolity and excess, Marie Antoinette led Rococo fashion with huge, poofy hairstyles, enormous pannier skirts and all manner of decorative frills, feathers and bows. The Austrian-born royal was thrust into the heart of Versailles from a young age, and quickly learned how to dress to impress as the country's new queen. Often portrayed throughout history as a naive party girl, Marie's obsession with clothing was also a powerful form of self-expression, exposing to the world her determined, if reckless, streak of independence. Marie was just 14 years old, when she was sent to France to marry King Louis XVI. On the border between Austria and France, she had to change into French clothing to make the right first impression, an experience that taught her the curious power of clothing in upholding nationality. Immediately thrown into the opulent, indulgent realms of Versailles, Marie was fascinated by the heady mix of fashion, politics and power, and it wasn't long before she became the leader of courtly fashion. Marie embraced the rising trends for Rococo style, which was filled with pale, pastel-toned silks, heavily layered skirts and ornate decorative elements, including jewels, ribbons and ruffles. Pannier skirts, known as the Garden Fanti, were much sought after, but impractical, constructed on an enormously wide frame that was sometimes up to 16 feet in diameter, above which waists were pulled into tiny, restricting corsets. Marie also helped popularize the robe à la française, also known as a sack-back gown, made popular by Louis XV's famous mistress Madame Pompadour. The dress was in three parts, an overskirt, petticoat and bodice, with characteristic pleating at the back of the dress, which ran from the bodice to the ground. Many were decorated with intricate embroideries, particularly floral patterns, which Marie expressed a preference for. Other dress styles led by Marie were the robe à la Polonaise, inspired by dresses from Poland, where the skirt is lifted into three sections at the back to reveal the petticoat beneath, and the robe à l'anglaise, a look inspired by English menswear with a short jacket, broad lapels and long sleeves incorporated into the gown. When Marie Antoinette's mother, Marie Theresa, received a portrait of her daughter dressed up in the latest French finery, she was said to be appalled by the lack of restraint, writing to her daughter, fashions should be followed in moderation, but should never be taken to extremes. A beautiful young woman, a graceful queen, has no need for such madness. As her time in the royal court grew, Marie became increasingly frustrated with the strict dress codes, and began breaking the rules. Her personal hair stylist, Leonard, took her love of wigs to new, gravity-defying heights, as well as introducing pastel-colored powders, and adding decorations including flowers, feathers, fake birds, pearls, lace, diamonds, and even small toys. Marie also employed her own in-house dress designer, the renowned Parisian couturier Marie-Jeanne Breton, known as Rose, who she titled her Minister of Fashion, encouraging her to create ever more indulgent and extravagant designs. The extent of her frivolities began to increasingly anger the poverty-stricken French public, who painfully felt the divide between them, and the hedonistic royals. 
Even Marie's own brother, Joseph II of Austria, mocked his sister, calling her elaborate wig too light to bear a crown. When he became king, Louis XVI had gifted Marie with her own chateau on the grounds of Versailles, which was her escape from the oppressive culture of court. The king granted her total freedom with the space, only entering himself on her permission. Marie had the place set up like a rural farm, where she and her ladies-in-waiting would wear loose, uncorseted dresses and have their long hair flowing over their shoulders. But Marie caused a huge scandal, when she had her portrait painted as a mock peasant, in a long, white cotton dress which looked like little more than underwear. Breaking down barriers between royals and real people in this way had never been done before, and though the public were appalled, Marie's dress, known as the chemise à la reine, or chemise of the queen, gradually caught on, first among the queen's friends, and later across Europe. Adopting, and unwittingly popularizing fabric from colonized India rather than France was a decidedly unpatriotic move from the queen, one which would play a part in unraveling both the French silk market, and eventually the entire monarchy, as the French Revolution took hold. When Jeremy Scott needed a gimmick for Moschino's Fall 2020 show, Marie Antoinette was there at the ready. And when the Hadids walked out, clad in cut-off 18th-century gowns, with punk ed-up poofs swirled atop their heads like icing, they were following in the footsteps of countless runway takes that had come before. Tom Brown had twisted his arsenal of seersucker and tweed into the corsets and panniers of her era. There's definitely a timeliness of her, falsely attributed, words. As films like Parasite and Knives Out illustrate our current culture's urge to eat the rich, those on top can't understand why those at the bottom wouldn't rather have cake. But if Marie Antoinette still meant to us what she signified to the French people, Madame Deficite, a symbol of indulgence and frivolity in a time of scarcity, we'd hate her, and we don't. And there's also the allure of the teenage princess played by Kirsten Dunst in Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette, stripped of her clothing and beloved dog, Mops, as she's passed off to France at the border. Lonely, beautiful, and seemingly ignorant of politics, it's hard to blame Dunst's queen for taking pleasure where she found it. And all that her courtiers would have whispered about, undercover trips to Parisian balls, trysts with a foreigner, just look, to the modern eye, like a woman taking control of her predetermined life. But even more than Coppola's playful teen queen, or a smoldering indignation against misogynists past, it has to be the petty mo. Marie Antoinette's purpose-built model village on the grounds of Versailles. There. She had a mill, a barn, a hen house, vegetable gardens, both a working dairy and a model dairy, and multiple spaces for entertaining. The image of a queen meandering through an agricultural set piece, pretending to collect already cleaned chicken eggs, is patently absurd, not to mention downright offensive to the actual peasants she ruled over, and also, somehow, charming. There. Marie Antoinette created her own little world, a simulacrum of pastoral life without any of its unappealing realities, the spoiled princess version of the petting zoos and tourist-friendly farms of my own Midwestern youth. And to fully enter her fantasy, the queen dressed the part, committing as wholly to white cotton dresses as she did to formal gowns back at the palace. It wasn't long before this new chemise à la reine caught on outside her faux humble abode, if Marie Antoinette wasn't known for exercising her political power, she relished her influence over Europe's fashions. And her sway proved far more enduring, 
than the Ancien Regime. It's easiest to see her in excess, in piles of ribbons and silk and lace. When a designer identifies her as his inspiration, it nearly always results in wide-hipped, heavily layered gowns and frilly, rococo pastels. But that's only one half of Marie Antoinette's stylistic legacy, and were it not for the other, she might not prove as indelible. Marie Antoinette stays with us because she embodies a dialectic, our love of consumerist self-indulgence, and our latent desire to give it all away.